I'm Gary, and this is Coasting with Culture. I like to combine theme park visits and riding roller coasters with various cultural experiences around the world. After about a week in Colombia, it was time to continue into country number two for this South American adventure, Ecuador. The first half of this time in Ecuador would be spent in the city of Quito and the rest of the time in Guayaquil. The visit to Quito kicks off with a stop at its lone amusement park and then exploring this beautiful city itself. So for the past week I've been in Colombia, but tonight is going to be the night of going to the next country, which is going to be Ecuador. About to get onto a plane from Bogota here to get over to Guayaquil and I'll be in Guayaquil just for the night because then tomorrow morning I'm going to catch another flight to get over to Quito. It was a relatively short journey to get from Bogota to Guayaquil on this late night flight with Avianca and it was just the first leg of the journey to begin exploring Ecuador. So not a whole lot to say about uh, Ecuador so far other than it's very wet outside. There was a downpour as we were coming out of the uh, airport and then after the cab ride it just happened to be a big band of rain. It sounds like Guayaquil is going to be very wet when I'm here uh, according to somebody who I spoke with. Otherwise though it's going to be an early night tonight. Tomorrow morning I'll be getting onto another plane to get to Quito and so I'm going to go ahead and call it a night so I can get ready to get to that flight. The next morning was also a wet one, but it would be an even shorter flight to Quito from Guayaquil. This was the first flight of the trip with Latam, but it wasn't my first flight on one of their planes as I had flown with them before in a bit of a peculiar location for a South American airline. Back in 2016 when my friend Philip and I visited Australia and New Zealand, we had a flight where we left from Auckland in New Zealand and arrived in Sydney in Australia. You would think that we flew with Air New Zealand or maybe with Qantas as I did many times on that trip, but no. The airline that we flew with? Latam, on one of their 787s. Auckland was a stopover from South America before the plane continued to Sydney and they were allowed to transport additional passengers between the two cities. For this flight, however, it was a short 50-minute domestic jump within the borders of Ecuador. Upon landing in Quito, I took advantage of the airport bus to get closer to the city center, as the newer airport, which had just opened a few years prior, was located on the other side of the mountains and valleys from the main part of the city. The windy roads and hilly terrain took some time to traverse, but it made for a really interesting ride. With this bus fare, you could get a taxi direct from the depot to wherever you were staying, which in my case was a nice centrally located Airbnb with an excellent view of the city from the living room. Got myself all checked in here in Quito, now it's time to go and explore. With the weather seeming to be likely to rain over the next few days I had in Quito, it made sense to go and hit the city's lone amusement park to try and get the credits early. So I went up the side of the mountains to the west side of Quito and visited Volcano Park. I believe the park's name is inspired by the nearby Pichincha Volcano. The park offered multiple Zamperla rides along with a few from other manufacturers. The smaller rides were separated from the larger rides by a covered arcade in the middle, which came in handy during this visit. Coming to this park gave the opportunity to get at least two coaster credits. The first was a Zamperla family gravity coaster known as Magma. While I was successful in getting this credit, I unfortunately would have a delay in attempting to get the second coaster. Apparently 
taking refuge from the thunderstorm that's passing over right now here at Volcano Park. I was getting into a conversation with one of the park employees about my travels and she was telling me about all the different parks in South America, uh, several of which are on my itinerary for this trip. And I'm really looking forward to getting a chance to check out. The only downside was that that conversation led to me having this delay. I could have probably knocked out both of the coasters real quick before the thunderstorm came. But you know, it is what it is. Thunderstorms happen. The good news is that I was able to get magma knocked out, the smaller Zamperla family coaster. Now I just have to wait until I can get to the bigger coaster. One thing's for sure, this rain took a bit to let up. But the delay wasn't all bad because she felt bad that the rain had come before I had a chance to get the other roller coaster knocked out. She actually gave me the opportunity to try out the VR attraction they have here where you're sitting in the motion seat and you do a couple of the different videos to go along with the movement. And the roller coaster one seemed like there was a little bit of a sinking issue. The uh, screen was a little bit split, but then we did another one that was like the giant pendulum rides you see at carnivals and fairs, and that was really, really bizarre to experience because of the fact that you knew it wasn't real, but it kind of felt like it in a way, even though it was one of those more basic motion simulators, so it was fascinating. Luckily, there was eventually a break in the weather. Good news is the rain stopped, so let's go and see if the roller coaster is open again. After a few test runs, visitors were allowed to give Krakaton a ride. Success! We've got Krakaton! What's neat about this is even though it's kind of your typical Pinfari looping coaster, when you get to the top of the lift hill, you actually get a pretty good view of Quito down below because this is up on the hill going up toward the uh, mountain. So definitely a really neat thing about this coaster that will set it apart from other uh, Pinfari Galaxy coasters or Pinfari looping coasters that you may ride. One of the things I was planning on doing after visiting Volcano Park here was to go ahead and take a ride on the Telefrico. But the problem though is that when you look at it going up to the mountain there, it's pretty cloudy up there. So unfortunately, that's probably not gonna happen today. Now the good news is that unlike the time that I had in Colombia, I'm actually spending more time here in Quito as I'll be here for about four days roughly with a day trip to another city. So there will be more chances to try to get up on Telefrico if it ends up working out. After successfully getting the coasters of Quito, it was time to head back into the city center, but because of where the park is, Ubers were a little harder to come by. So I went down to get closer to where they may be. Leaving from the park, it's a hell of a climb down this hill. Didn't realize how steep it was when I was riding in that Uber. Definitely makes a difference for sure. Once I got back to the Airbnb, I changed into some dry clothes and went for a short walk to get some dinner, passing by yet another beautiful cathedral named Santa Teresita although this was more like a preview for the next day. After a bit of a rough night's sleep, I was ready for some cultural experiences in Quito. Taking advantage of the location of my Airbnb, I walked down toward Quito's old town, but first found Mercado Artesanal La Mariscal along the way. This market was a prime location to find more traditional Ecuadorian items that you could take home as souvenirs. One thing that fascinated me about the place was the name of the street that it sat upon, which seemed to be based on somewhat of a familiar name. I also saw some interesting sculptures in a nice tree-filled park known as Parque El Ijido, which was only two blocks away from the market. But what may have been the highlight of the day exploring Quito was Basilica del Volto Nacional, or Basilica of the National Vow. An incredible 19th century church with a neo-Gothic style that sits on top of a hill, making it easy to see from many parts of the city. Its design was inspired by the cathedral in Bourges, as well as Notre Dame in Paris, France, but with some Ecuadorian flair. 
While the French basilicas have stone gargoyles on their sides, this one featured native animals like tortoises, iguanas, and condors. Construction began in 1892, and technically speaking, it's never been finished. The local legend in Quito is that when the basilica is completed, the world will end. So hopefully they'll keep working on it for a while. Just before you enter, you're greeted by the statue of Pope John Paul II, or Juan Pablo II as those in Latin America would know him, for he was the one who blessed this church in 1985. Underneath his tribute, there are these highly detailed sculpted metal doors that portray biblical moments. And when they're open, you can pay an admission to have a look at the wonders inside. This church has some incredible stained glass windows above some of the side altars and along the ceiling. The ceiling is supported by arches similar to the likes of Notre Dame, and the supports are lined with sculptures on the side where the pews are located and paintings on the opposite side. The church also offers visitors the chance to pay their respects to the likes of Father Jesus Rigoberto Correa Vasquez, a priest who dedicated his life to the construction of this temple, Jose Ignacio Checa y Barba, the fifth Archbishop of Quito, who was poisoned during the Good Friday ceremony of 1877 in full view of all attendees, and Gabriel Garcia Moreno, the seventh president of Ecuador, whose passing came by way of assassination. While there is much to see on the main floor, visitors may want to take this exploration to another level, which you can do at this church as they allow you to explore higher parts of this iconic building. When you reach the second floor, you'll see the organ of the church and the beautifully stained glass rose window in the south end of the building. This sits directly across from an opening that looks into the nave and to the pews below. Plus it gives you a level view of the incredible stained glass windows along the ceiling. Going to the upper levels also offers a lot of space to catch a peek to the outside, where you can see the architecture up close, or enjoy a glimpse at the city below. Of course, there's more where that came from. Definitely take your time with the stairs. You gotta remember that you're several thousand feet above sea level and it's not always that easy if you're not adjusted to it, so take your time. If you do need a break, some parts of the stairways have windows where you can see more of the church exterior. In the third floor, you'll find a gift shop, and if you continue through it, you'll get to one of the first great viewing locations for the outside of the church, as there's a deck that looks south toward Quito's Old Town. The obvious reward of climbing to the top of the tower is getting a chance to enjoy this fantastic view of the old town of Quito, one of the oldest old towns you'll find anywhere in the world. This floor is where your adventurous side can really come out, as across from the outer viewing deck is a bridge that crosses over to the central tower of the church between the nave and roof, and it's open to visitors who would like to check it out. When you reach the other side, you just have to climb the ladder to access the tower. I 
believe the view from here makes it worth the time. While you can enjoy the amazing architecture up close, you can go to the highest platform of the central tower if you wish. As strange as it may sound, this might be one ladder a little too much for me. You know, the uh, adjusting to the uh, altitude on top of the fact that this doesn't look very secure in a way um, might be a little bit much for my taste today. But if you are here and you want to get to the very top of the central tower, definitely do because it'll probably open up the view even more so. But even from this level, if you're only comfortable with going this far, this is a great spot to view as well. But there's still even more of this cathedral to see. The central tower isn't the only tower of the church you can access, as both of the clock towers have some level of public access. Why don't we go see what we can get into, shall we? If you wish to go to the highest point available in the clock towers, there will be a lot of stairs, as both towers reach over 370 feet above the ground. but there are places along the way to stop and look around for a bit. As you climb the metal spiral staircase, this brings you into the clock face portion of the tower. Here you can see the mechanism that operates it, and there are portraits that show the progress of the construction of the church, which was a process of over a hundred years before it was inaugurated. One final spiral staircase, and this brings you to the highest level accessible by visitors. Here, you are rewarded with some of the best views of the city anywhere. And there really is no shortage of fantastic views from this cathedral. I mean, it's incredible to get up to the top of this tower and to be able to see the city down below and other parts of the cathedral itself. Not many cathedrals give you this opportunity to really climb and explore it like this. This is pretty freaking cool. But, you know, after all that climbing, I'll tell you what, I could really go for a beer. To do that, you will need to go back down, but not quite all the way. Switching to the other tower, there is a cafe a couple floors up from level three and this cafe offers you a chance to enjoy a bite to eat. Or if you'd like, you can enjoy a nice cold cerveza. And the weary traveler climbed to the highest point in the house of the Lord, and he asked the Lord, may I please have a beer? And the Lord granted him a beer. And the weary traveler drank the beer. And it was good. It may not be ceremonial wine, but it was a nice cap to one of the best visits I've ever had exploring a church anywhere. Visiting the cathedral has been amazing, but there's still a lot more to see here in Quito. Heading further south from the Basilica will take you down the hill it sits upon toward the direction of Quito's Old Town, with its narrow streets and classic buildings.
After about eight or nine blocks, you'll come to the heart of Quito's old town, Independence Square. When you arrive, there's a good chance you'll hear one of the many street musicians performing nearby. The square has a beautifully landscaped appearance with plenty of seating to just take it in. And right in the middle is the monument symbolizing the first cry for independence of Ecuador. Most of the buildings surrounding it date back to Ecuador's colonial period, including Palacio de Carondelet the government seat of Ecuador and Presidential Palace, complete with guards at the main entrance. If you wish to see more of Quito's houses of worship, there are others to see nearby, like Catedral Metropolitana, which sits alongside the plaza, or a few blocks further away for the likes of the Church of the Jesuits. Of course, if you've had your fill of churches, there are other things to see in old Quito, such as the former Banco Central del Ecuador, the nation's former central bank turned currency museum. Now even though Ecuador has switched from their currency to the US dollar, every so often within their change you'll still find coins that were from the past from Ecuador. So if you're a foreign change coin collector like I am, then you'll find some Ecuadorian coins when using money here in Ecuador. Before going to scope out this hill, there was one particular street I was seeking, which was built on an old riverbed Calle de la Ronda. This is a place with several restaurants and a particular dish I read about which I wanted to try. So I found a place with it on their menu, which happened to offer a nice spot above La Ronda to watch the people as they walked by. Before long, I'd have a Largato Lager from Camino del Sol Brewing and the dish that I read about. I was looking up things to do here in Quito. I had seen that they mentioned the locro de papa, the potato and cheese soup with some avocado. And it looks and smells superb. Mm. I can see why people like this because on a cooler day here in Quito, this would be a great way to warm up. Ooh. Definitely very creamy too. Muy delicioso. Thank you for watching this Coasting with Culture video. If you'd like to see future videos about combining theme park visits and cultural experiences, please consider clicking that subscribe button down below. You'll also find Coasting with Culture on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, plus more content at coastingwithculture.com. Until next time, take care and safe travel.